Hello, this is Maciek, the Diligent Linguist. Welcome to my next video. Today I want to talk to you about Biernik, the Polish accusative case, which is usually introduced quite early during a beginner course of Polish as a foreign language. It is a very useful case as it allows you to use a giant number of verbs, action words, um, that uh, refer to an external object. In other words, there is the subject, the performer of the action, the verb, so the action itself, and an object, a thing or person that the action is performed on, or something or someone that the action refers to. Take the Polish word jabłko, meaning apple, as an example. Widzę jabłko. Mam jabłko. Jem jabłko. Hmm. Lubię to jabłko. Hmm. Now, the sentences seem pretty simple, and the word jabłko appears like taken straight from an English to Polish dictionary. In fact, uh, objects expressed in the accusative case will often look like this. Not always, but very often. Um, the object of our action will often remain in its base dictionary form. However, there are certain rules and exceptions to be remembered. Look at the following flowchart. Is the object noun feminine? If so, change the final a into e. Then add the tail to the final a, effectively changing it into on, in all adjectives describing the noun. Is the noun masculine and animate, representing a living entity? If so, append it with a. If the noun already ends in a, change it into e. And then add the suffix ego to any adjective describing the object. If your noun does not fit into either of the two categories mentioned earlier, just leave it the way it is. Leave it in the base nominative form. And that's it. End of the video. Well, not exactly. But you would probably manage successfully to handle the majority of grammatical exercises and test items based on the accusative case. Now, I want to make three things clear. First, uh, the suffix "-ar", added uh, to a living uh, nouns, masculine nouns, does not mean that the noun magically becomes feminine. No, it is just an ending, a suffix added to animate masculine nouns. Uh, the form does change, but the grammatical gender remains the same. Number two, a lot of students learning about the accusative case already know about the instrumental case, narzędnik. Feminine noun phrases in the instrumental case look very similar to feminine noun phrases in the accusative case, biernik. In both cases, adjectives receive tails at their ends. In other words, the word final a becomes on. However, whereas in the instrumental case, nouns also get tails, in the accusative case, uh, we put the letter on at the end instead. Have a look. Wysoka dziewczyna. A tall girl. Mam wysoką dziewczynę. Idę z wysoką dziewczyną. And three. If you notice uh, the letter E or the cluster IE in the final syllable, of a masculine noun, you will probably have to remove it. So we say 
mam psa, not piesa. And we say widzę chłopca, not chłopieca. Most Polish language course books will stop at this point, but is it really everything you can learn about the Polish biernik, the accusative case? Well, I remember when I used to assume that everything has been said and I can progress to the next lesson. But then we would start this unit called Co lubisz robić? And lubić is a verb that is commonly followed by an object in the accusative case. The same applies to a longer expression lubić grać w to like to do a certain sport or to like to play a specific game. Now, of course, I wanted my students to make their own sentences. I thought this was going to be super easy, as uh, we mostly use inanimate nouns while we're talking about our free time activities, uh, favorite sports or pastimes. Uh, to be a smart teacher, of course, I reminded uh, my students that uh, they need to adjust um, uh, the feminine forms. Uh, and then, and then I hear my students come up with sentences such as Lubię grać w tenis. And I say, no, 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 w tenisa. Okay, another student says Lubię grać w badminton. And I say, no, Lubię grać w badmintona. And another student, uh, student will say Lubię grać w krykiet. I say, no, ho ho hold on, w krykieta. And I, I, I just can imagine the large question marks over their heads. Why? <sighs> and the available course books just ignore the topic and I can't blame them. They're trying to present the accusative case um, in such a way that you will manage to handle the majority of situations, but in some cases you will continue to make mistakes. Now, from this moment on, this video is for people who want to learn a bit more about Biernik. Okay, so you might be thinking that I'm referring to some sort of um, exceptional situations, to some really rare examples, but just think about it. If I had chosen to ignore the subject and if I had told my students that, oh, these are exceptions, um, you don't need to learn about them, then the problem would have struck me back right in the next unit about food and eating. Lubię uh, kurczak. Hold on. Lubię kurczaka. Okay. Kurczak actually means a chicken, so it indicates an animal. So the addition of a at the end makes sense. But then what about lubię burger? Lubię burgera. In my flowchart, I only mentioned, just like most course book do, that you should add a to nouns indicating people and animals. But it seems that there are some additional groups or categories where this rule also needs to be applied. So what are these exceptions? Masculine nouns that need to be treated like living uh, entities. Let's make one thing clear. The term animate noun in the context of uh, Biernik, in the context of the accusative case, is simply a convenient label used by language course books to make the topic more tangible, to make it easier to study, easier to introduce. Uh, according to various academic sources, we can specify between 8 and 15 different categories. In this video, I'm going to break it down into 12 categories. There is no doubt that we have to add a to masculine nouns symbolizing animate things, living entities. So uh, we will add it to names of human beings, animals or fish, or fictional creatures resembling humans. The same rule applies to fictional or supernatural beings, such as vampires, angels, hobbits. Even if the creature is no longer alive, the grammatical rule still stands. So you can say 
zobaczył trupa. Or zobaczył nieboszczyka. The word skillet would be an exception here. Perhaps because it indicates part of the body, the bone structure, rather than uh, an entire human or animal. However, I must admit I have heard lots of gamers using expressions such as pokonać szkieleta, when the skeleton was actually an opponent in a game, so in a situation when it behaved like a living thing, or perhaps like something like a ghost. I cannot say for sure, though, uh, if such forms are, in fact, grammatically uh, correct. Even bacteria and viruses seem to fit within this category. Złapać gronkowca. Złapać wirusa. Names of illnesses and various medical conditions may also follow this rule, but I noticed that it chiefly applies to the ones whose names are based on surnames of scholars, who first identified the disease. For example, cierpieć na Alzheimera, chorować na Parkinsona. Or, if they are derived from names of living entities, as in mieć raka. There is also an overall trend uh, to add a to informal names of sicknesses, as in złapać syfa. On the other hand, nothing needs to be added when we're talking about symptoms. For example, mam katar or mam kaszel. Thirdly, there are names of most, but not all, fruits and vegetables. For example, mam pomidora, ogórka, kalafiora, ananasa, banana. Interestingly, in many cases, adding the a suffix is actually optional. What about other foods? To me, the situation seems clearest uh, when it comes to names based on animals, such as kurczak or indyk. Um, the same applies to um, dishes based on meat or fish. Jeść kotleta, schnitzla, hamburgera, rolmopsa. However, I have studied the topic and it seems that such forms are common but um, informal. And that's actually good news for people learning the Polish language. When you forget to add the A ending and you say something like jem kotlet or poproszę schnitzel, you are actually sounding a bit more refined. You're sounding more formal. The same uh, rule applies to various types of nuts. Uh, jeść orzecha or jeść migdała. But we might as well say zjeść orzech or zjeść migdał. I think I also found one source uh, mentioning, mentioning exactly the same thing about cakes. Jeść makowiec or, informally, jeść makowca. Oh, and don't forget the Polish dish called gołąbki. We say zjadłem gołąbka. Why? Probably because the word gołąbek basically means uh, a pigeon. I have also noticed that uh, people usually say jeść pączka rather than jeść pączek. If you like eating or collecting mushrooms, you might want to know that you need to add a to the names of uh, most uh, mushroom types. For example, znalazłem podgrzybka, borowika, prawdziwka, maślaka, kozaka, Finally, there is uh, a somewhat related group of nouns related to uh, smoking cigarettes. Uh, cigarettes are not exactly food, uh, but uh, I can find some sort of relation uh, between these two categories. So we say palić papierosa. In fact, we could use any masculine synonym of the word uh, papieros, and the rule would still have to be followed. For example, uh, while saying informally, palić szluga, peta, um, and so on. Some people wonder, what about plants? Well, we don't usually add anything to names of plants, uh, bushes or trees, but I did notice uh, that flowers require the animate treatment. So uh, my fourth category would be flowers. 
and uh, I can see it in expressions like uh, kupić tulipana or kupić goździka. Number five, styles of dance such as rock and roll, twist, waltz, polones. Uh, it's uh, important to notice that after the verb tańczyć, the name of a particular style is expressed in the accusative case. However, I have also noticed two common exceptions, breakdance and hip hop, most probably because the words have been borrowed into the Polish lexicon relatively um, recently and their status as loan words is still reflected in the application of grammatical rules. So we tend not to change the forms of these words. After a more careful investigation, I actually learned that we can say tańczyć breakdance as well as tańczyć breakdansa. And please notice the required apostrophe. Six, my personal favorite, names of sports and games, very often used after the verb grać. For instance, grać w badmintona, w tenisa, w pingponga, w hokeja, w krykieta. It does not have to be an actual sport. It may be a game played by kids outdoors or indoors. For example, bawić się w berka, grać w zbijaka. This category also includes card games. Grać w brydża, w pokera, w tysiąca, as well as some board games. For example, grać w chińczyka. I noticed one thing here. If the noun expressing the name of the game is already present in the Polish language and it already represents some other meaning, then we usually follow the already established pattern. This is exactly why we say grać w Chińczyka, but grać w monopol. The word Chińczyk has existed in the Polish language for a long, long time and its primary meaning is a Chinese man. So it refers to a human being. Monopol, on the other hand, means monopoly, which is an abstract, inanimate term. Oh, and from what I have learned, we must not add a to the word billard, meaning billiards. So we say grać w billard. I should mention computer games as an important subcategory here. I've been hearing patterns typical of uh, sports in the context of computer games ever since the 1980s. Let us consider a couple of masculine examples from each decade. Um, the 1980s. Grać w Pacmana. Grać w Tetrisa. The 1990s. Grać w Quaker. Grać w Duma. In my opinion, exceptions included complex names, especially containing two or more nouns. Some gamers would uh, use only one word from the name um, of the game and then add a to it, as in grać w mortala to mean mortal combat, uh, or grać w duka when referring to Duke Nukem. Another option was that uh, the suffix a could be attached to the last noun in such a complex um, noun phrase or simply a long name of a computer game, as in grać w Tomb Raider, that's the Polish pronunciation of Tomb Raider, that used to be quite common in the 1990s. Grać w Half-Life, grać w Warcraft. I am not an expert on games from the, uh, from the 21st century, so to speak, uh, but I have seen forms such as grać w Crysisa, grać w Portala, uh, grać w Fortnite. So I think the topic of computer games in the context of the Polish system of cases certainly deserves more attention. Okay, computer games aside, how about chess pieces? or the various ranks in a deck of playing cards. Well, we also have to treat them as living, living entities, as in miecz asa, króla, waleta, 
Interestingly, the same applies to masculine names of suits in a deck of cards. Miech Trefla, Miech Pika, Kiera. Note that Karo, indicating the suit of diamonds, is a neuter noun, so we will not consider it here. In chess, we apply the same rule to the masculine names of uh, various pieces. So we say przesunąć skoczka or gońca. The more advanced learners may realize that for the majority of these words, the basic meanings indicate uh, living entities. I mean, outside the context of the chess game. And one last thing, uh, the regular pawns can, but don't have to, take the suffix a. So you can either say stracić pionek or stracić pionka. I should mention that uh, the same rule would apply to all other uh, types of card games or role-playing games. Next, there is the group of uh, manufactured products. A type of situation when we want to use a brand name to indicate a specific type of product. Think about IBM or Apple computers. In English, you could say I bought an IBM or I bought a Mac, an iPad, an iPhone and so on. Uh, the recipient knows what kind of device we're talking about. We can do the same in Polish by saying kupiłem IBM, -a. kupiłem Maca, kupiłem iPada, iPhone. Now, you might want to ask, what if I keep the base nominative form? For example, kupiłem IBM. Well, my association would be that the speaker bought not the product, but the entire company. Look at the following headline. But, look at the following one. Czy masz Instagrama? The same applies to automotive brands, as in kupiłem Mercedesa, kupiłem Hyundai, or kupiłem Chevroleta. If it's clear, what type of product we're talking about, we can use the discussed rule to talk about household items, such as a TV set, a cooker, a dishwasher, a washing machine, as in kupiłem Bosha, kupiłem Sharpa, kupiłem Philipsa. Just remember, we are only talking about masculine nouns. The remaining five categories are really limited and tiny compared to uh, what we have presented so far. My number eight are currencies. So, mieć dolara, uh, kupić jena, sprzedać rubla or franka. My number nine are planets and stars. Lecieć na Marsa, Jowisza, oglądać Syriusza, Number 10 is a funny one, because um, all names referring to the penis will also require the a suffix. For example, zbadać penisa. Number 11 is related to my earlier discussion of sports and games. What I want to say is that if a specific part of the game is represented by a masculine noun, it also needs to be appended with the R suffix. Uh, for example, in tennis, we can say wygrać szlema, wygrać seta, or wygrać gema. Number 12. It's not a real category. I'd like to mention a collection of examples and I'd like you to try and categorize them, because these ones may be really tricky. So think about it. Mieć pecha. Nabić sobie guza. Złapać bakcyla. Wywinąć kozła. Zrobić fikołka. Leczyć kaca. Mieć fioła. Spłatać figla. Przygotować sobie gotowca. Mieć pietra. Stanąć dęba and finally, a funny one, puścić bąka. Do you think they fit in 
any of the previously mentioned categories? Let me know in the comments. I'd be really happy to get to know your opinion. To summarize, in my very subjective opinion, the majority of uh, Polish language course books provide you with simplified rules and patterns that will allow you to successfully and accurately build, let's say, 90% of sentences and phrases containing the accusative case. Uh, the goal of my video was to also consider the remaining troublesome uh, 10%. Uh, and I hope you liked my presentation. If there is something I might improve in the future, please let me know in the comment section below. Um, thank you so much for watching. If you like my content, consider subscribing to my channel. And remember, never stop learning languages. See you next time. Thank you.